I was dating Tupac Shakur at the time, and the thing is, he like got me all riled up about life in general. So when I went on this show, I was feeling very gangster. I didn't know you dated I, Tupac Shakur. That was Shakur. a surprise. That's never been out there, I don't think. Madonna is real nice. She's a good person. She helped me a lot. She was real cool. When he first got arrested, nobody had his back. He said the first person that came to have his back was Madonna. So Madonna and Tupac are two of the most legendary names in the music industry. But a lot of people today might not know that they had a brief romance back in the 90s. This wasn't just any fling. There was a secret letter from Tupac that shed light on why they broke up and even warned Madonna about some dangerous people around her. The world is shocked by the letter from Tupac to Madonna that has been hidden for 20 years. Tupac Shakur reveals why he broke up with Madonna. Tupac believed these people would eventually be responsible for his demise. Even though Keith D has been arrested for Tupac's murder, many still believe there was a mastermind behind it all, and they point the finger at P. Diddy. So why was Tupac so keen on protecting Madonna from Diddy? Let's take a closer look. Tupac Shakur, in his short 25 years, left an indelible mark on the black culture, achieving more than most people do in a lifetime. Similarly, Madonna has been the reigning queen of pop for nearly four decades, setting the bar for what it means to be a modern female pop star. When their paths crossed in the mid-90s, it seemed like a match made in pop culture heaven. But societal pressures and their own noisy lives made it tough for them to sustain a relationship. If their romance had blossomed, it could have been a significant moment in history, changing the trajectories of both their lives and careers. But unfortunately, it didn't work out, and we're left imagining what could have been. Now, it's confirmed that Madonna and Tupac had a romantic connection at some point in the 90s, but details are limited. The most concrete piece of evidence we have is a heartfelt letter from Tupac. According to actress Rosie Perez, she introduced the two at the Soul Train Awards in 1993. I was invited to Soul Train Music Awards. Pac was a very, very close friend of mine. I was sitting in the front row and Madonna just goes, oh, I went over to Pac and I said, Pac, Madonna wants to hook up with you. He's like, where, where? However, it's unclear when they ended their relationship. Madonna has been notably private about her time with Tupac, only confirming in March 2015 that they were an item shortly before his death. Madonna has spoken about Tupac in the context of a particularly infamous appearance on The Late Show with David Letterman in 1994. During this episode, she dropped a barrage of expletives and exhibited provocative behavior, clearly trying to shock the audience and Letterman himself. But nearly 30 years later, she told Howard Stern that her brash behavior behavior during that interview was influenced by Tupac. She said she was riled up by her then-boyfriend and wanted to appear gangster on national television. I was in a weird mood that day. I was dating Tupac Shakur at the time and he had got me all riled up about life in general. So when I went on the show I was feeling very gangster, she explained. I was dating Tupac Shakur at the time and the thing is he like got me all riled up about life in general. So when I went on this show I was feeling very gangster. I didn't know you dated I, Tupac that was Shakur. A surprise. That's never been out there, I don't Think. Back in July 2017, a letter Tupac wrote while at Clinton Correctional Facility went up for auction and fetched more than $170,000. This letter, dated January 15, 1995, was addressed to Madonna, whom he affectionately called M. Even though some parts of the letter were censored, it still dives deep into why they broke up and Tupac's raw feelings about Madonna. Tupac starts off by saying he's waited a long time to write this letter because he struggled to find the right words to express his emotions. He kicks things off with an apology, admitting he hasn't been the kind of friend I know I'm capable of being. It's clear he's wrestling with a lot of guilt and regret over how things went down between them. Then Tupac gets into the details of their breakup. He tells Madonna that her dating a black man wouldn't really matter to the world. It might even make her seem more open and exciting. But for him, it was a whole different ballgame. Tupac had built his career on representing the struggles of the black community. He needed to stay true to his people and preserve his image, to continue shedding light on racial injustice through his music. He didn't think he could do that effectively while being romantically linked with Madonna. It's like a modern-day Romeo and Juliet, where their love is torn apart by societal pressures and political tensions rather than their own choices. Tupac writes, For you to be seen with a black man wouldn't in any way jeopardize your career. But for me, at least in my 
my previous perception. I felt due to my image, I would be letting down half of the people who made me what I thought I was. Tupac goes on to say he never meant to hurt Madonna, though he doesn't specify what he's referring to. He mentions an interview where she supposedly talked about dating other rappers and basketball players. Tupac admits he hadn't known about these other relationships, so when he found out, he felt he had to defend his heart and ego. This part of the letter is a bit murky, especially since some sentences have been redacted, but it's clear Tupac is bearing his soul and showing a side of him that's vulnerable and real. Even though Tupac might have regretted some things he said during their breakup, he makes it clear in the letter that he's grown a lot over the past year. He's become more spiritually and mentally mature, and he's ready to move forward with a different but positive dynamic with Madonna, friendship. Tupac acknowledges that he's no longer the young man who was easily swayed by public perception and had limited experience dealing with a massively famous SEX symbol like Madonna. Now, he's more focused and confident in who he is. He offers her his wholehearted friendship, this time much stronger and focused. Then the letter takes a somewhat cryptic and foreboding turn towards the end. Tupac says he felt compelled to share his feelings with Madonna in case anything happened to me. He urges her to be careful, warning that everyone is not as honorable as they seem. This part is especially poignant given what we know now about Tupac's fate. It's like he had a premonition of the danger lurking around him. Tupac also mentions that he hopes Madonna would visit him in prison, saying he'd love to speak face to face. Sadly, she never showed up. Madonna is coming to visit me. Madonna has so much power that the guards let me take an extra shower because they thought she was coming to visit me. And did she come? No. But the story takes a different twist when we bring in Jacques Agnant, also known as Haitian Jack. According to him, it was actually Madonna who ended the relationship because she felt Tupac was two-faced and not being genuine. And then Pac and Madonna started hanging out. The problem with Pac and Madonna he liked it, her. And she realized that he wasn't who he said he was. For those who might not be familiar, Haitian Jack is a music executive and promoter in the rap industry, with a history as a convicted felon and accused p He's worked with big names like Tupac and Madonna and was known for his connections and influence in the industry. When people in the rap game needed muscle, Haitian Jack was often the go-to guy. By the early 90s, Haitian Jack was a well-known figure in New York. He had a solid reputation in the streets and was a big player in the nightlife scene. Party promoters respected him, DJs gave him props, and everyone from athletes to entertainers knew who Jack was. So it wasn't too surprising when a chance meeting in an Atlanta studio brought him face to face with Madonna. One of the biggest pop stars in the world at that time. Madonna and Jack instantly hit it off. He had that bad boy charisma that she was drawn to in the 90s, with his street ties only adding to his appeal. Given how often rappers and street figures crossed paths, Haitian Jack eventually met Tupac Shakur in 1993. By then, Tupac's reputation was almost as notorious as Jack's. He was seen as a public enemy, attracting drama and violence wherever he went. Tupac had a long list of controversies by the time he met Jack. He'd sued the Oakland Police Department for $10 million after being assaulted by two officers who stopped him for jaywalking. Vice President Dan Quayle had called for his debut album, Two Pacalypse Now, to be pulled from shelves after Ronald Ray Howard's attorney claimed the music incited Howard to Kai Word a Texas trooper. In April 1993, Tupac was charged with assault in Michigan after trying to hit another rapper with a baseball bat at a concert. Just three months later, he confessed on Yo! MTV Raps to beating up Menace 2 Society directors Albert and Alan Hughes, which earned him 15 days in jail. I beat up the directors to minutes to the side. Let me tell the whole world. All right, tell All me right. you did with Jack. He's chump, punk, slump, you know what I'm saying? They fired me, but did it in a roundabout punk snitch way. So I caught them on the streets and beat they behind. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, okay. In 93, Tupac was in New York filming the cult classic Above the Rim, where he played Birdie, a New York gangster with the flash and charisma of someone like Haitian Jack, but who also ruled through fear. Tupac was no stranger to the harsh realities of ghetto life. His mother's crack addiction had strained their relationship, and his father was absent. His role models, by default, were the dealers, pimps, and that populated his environment. Being around Haitian Jack was like taking an advanced course in the gritty politics of the streets. In a landmark interview with Vibe from Rikers Island a few years later, Tupac confessed that Jack had introduced him to a lifestyle he had only ever brushed against before. I used to dress in baggies and sneakers. They took me shopping. That's when I bought my Rolex and all my jewels, Tupac said. They made me mature. They introduced me to all these gangsters in Brooklyn. 
Jack himself reminisced about this on Hip Hop Uncovered, saying, One day, Shakur said to me, I'm glad I met you when I did because it really helped with that character I was working on. Then I said, You got something from me? He was like, Yeah, man. Just your swagger, the way you handle yourself, how everybody's always around you. That was important for me to see that that happens, that people gravitate to a gangster. However, this period of mentorship and camaraderie came to an abrupt end on the night of November 18, 1993. Just before Thanksgiving, Tupac, Haitian Jack, and others were charged with S.A. 19-year-old Ayana Jackson in Tupac's 38th The Floor Room at the Parker Meridian Hotel. Ayana Jackson first crossed paths with Tupac at the Manhattan nightclub Nels, where they engaged in consensual SEX. A few nights later, Haitian Jack told Tupac that Jackson would be coming over again. Tupac recalled that Jack was making drinks for everyone, and the evening seemed like any other night. Biggie Smalls was also there, waiting to accompany Tupac to a show in New Jersey, but he left shortly after Jackson arrived. According to Jackson, she and Tupac were alone in his bedroom when other men entered and proceeded to R-word her. Tupac said that when the other men walked into the room, he felt uncomfortable with the group setting and left. He spoke with his publicist in another room, felt groggy, and went to sleep. He was awakened by Jackson yelling at him for allowing the men to A her. In Hip Hop Uncovered, Haitian Jack expressed his annoyance with Jackson, but directed most of his anger at Tupac. Pac was all good when I was doing things for him, until we caught that punk-ass case that easily could have been beaten by both of us, Haitian Jack said. He let his attorneys turn him against me, and that's the part I'll never forgive him for because I'm going ride or die with you, homie. I expect you to do the same. See, that's what I call a fair-weather friend. Pac was all good when I was doing good things to him, until we caught that case that was easily could have been beaten by both of us. Let his attorneys turn him against me, and that's the part that I'll never forgive him for because I'm going to ride or die with you, homie. I expect you to do the same. One of the biggest mysteries in rap history is what exactly happened that night. Jackson was clearly assaulted, but the details are murky. Tupac and his road manager, Charles Fuller, were both convicted of first-degree S.A. At his sentencing in February 1995, Tupac apologized to Jackson while maintaining his innocence regarding the crime. This incident left an indelible mark on Tupac's career, one that he admitted he deeply regretted. Even though I'm innocent of the charge they gave me, I'm not innocent in terms of the way I was acting, Tupac said. I don't know if she's with these N or if she's mad at me for not protecting her, but I know I feel ashamed because I wanted to be accepted and because I didn't want any harm done to me. I didn't say anything. After the assault charges and weapons possession charge from that night, Tupac spent much of 1994 vehemently proclaiming his innocence. The fear of being remembered as a haunted him deeply. This entire ordeal strained his relationship with Haitian Jack. Through various media outlets, Tupac branded Jack as a hanger-on, and on November 29th, he delivered one of his most emotionally charged interviews, pleading his innocence once again and expressing frustration that his case was being tried separately, even though he wasn't the only one charged that night. I go to jail for a crime. Everybody know I did not commit. Get shot five times, and I'm getting in jail, woundy, wonky, they just say anything to assassinate my character. That's why many people do not believe Haitian Jack's recent claims, because he and Tupac never reconciled before Tupac's tragic death. It seems like Jack might be trying to rewrite history now that Tupac isn't around to defend himself. Before their fallout, even boxer Mike Tyson warned Tupac that he was out of his league hanging with Haitian Jack. There's a rumor that you told Pac not to hang out with Haitian Jack, but he didn't listen. Well, I told Pac, but I say I don't know if you, I think you're out of your league right now. Biggie Smalls also advised him to be cautious about the street guys he was mingling with, including Haitian Jack. But Tupac didn't heed these warnings, which eventually strained his friendship with Biggie as well. Tupac and Biggie were once very close friends. Some say they first met on the set of Poetic Justice. Tupac was blasting Biggie's Party and Bullish on repeat, which was a big deal for Biggie, who was still an up-and-coming artist at the time. It was his first single, and having Tupac, already a huge star, play it constantly was a massive endorsement. Biggie would crash at Tupac's L.A. house when he visited from New York, and Tupac would send him bottles of Hennessy and offer advice. They even performed together, freestyling back and forth on stage at venues like Madison Square Garden. At this point, Tupac was a platinum-selling musician and movie star, while Biggie was still struggling to get his career to take off at the same rapid pace. Biggie once asked Tupac to take over from Puff as his manager. Tupac advised him to stay with Puff, reassuring him, he will make you a star, but things took a dark turn. After 
After being called up to the studio by Biggie's affiliate, Lil Cease, Tupac was shot, beaten, and robbed of his jewelry. Finding Biggie and Puff inside the building afterward, Tupac was led to believe that Biggie was behind the attack, which ended their friendship that night. Unable to pay the $3 million bail, Tupac served most of his sentence in a maximum security prison. During his time behind bars, Tupac, along with Death Row Records head Honcho Shug Knight, vowed to take down Puff and Biggie's rival label, Bad Boy Records. The reason Shug Knight got involved in the feud was his long-standing beef with Puff Daddy. Sujay didn't like Puff because Puffy was outshining him with Bad Boy Records, which was flourishing while Death Row was facing its own challenges. On August 3, 1992, during the Source Awards in New York City, Suge Knight publicly took a shot at Puff Daddy. With all the artists present, Suge boldly declared, If you want to be a star without worrying about the executive producer hogging the videos, getting all up in your records, and dancing, come to Death Row. This jab was aimed at Puff Daddy's notorious habit of appearing in his artists' music videos and adding ad-libs to their songs. The rivalry didn't end there. The following month, Suge Knight and Puff Daddy both attended a birthday bash for musician Jermaine Dupri at the Platinum House Club in Atlanta. The tension between their respective entourages was palpable. The conflict spilled out of the club, culminating in a tragic incident where Jai Big Jake Robles, a close friend of Suge and a Death Row Blood affiliate, was shot and K-worded while getting into a limousine. Suge Knight accused Puff Daddy of being involved in the shooting, escalating the animosity between them. In response to the escalating violence, and fearing for his life, Puff Daddy sought protection from Keith D, a known figure in the streets, through his friend Eric Von Zip Martin. Keith D recalls receiving a call from a member of Bad Boy Records saying, Your boy Big CEO is tripping, a clear reference to Suge Knight. Keith responded by saying, Just send me 40 to 50 tickets and we'll be in there deep at all your concerts. It, it, it was Puff. And he like, You think it's cool to come out here and do concerts? I'm like, Why well, wouldn't it be cool? So he like, the big CEO dude. So, shook. Yeah. Puffy started giving them tickets to be at their West Coast shows. Keith and his crew went everywhere with Bad Boy, meeting up at hotels, getting tickets, and accompanying them to events. Crips were backstage, deep at most of the West Coast shows, providing a formidable presence. Because Zip and Puffy were always in contact with Keith, he always knew where Puffy was and could quickly mobilize if anything were to happen. Keith recalls that Puff was so scared that he hired ex Navy SEALs for protection. These guys were professional, wearing earpieces like they worked for the CIA stationed in the hotel room next to Puffy's suite. As the feud escalated, the media jumped into the mix, labeling the conflict a coastal rap war and providing continuous coverage. This media attention led fans from both hip-hop scenes to take sides. Back in October 1995, Tupac crossed paths with Biggie's estranged wife, Faith Evans, at a party. They struck a deal where Tupac agreed to cough up $250,000 for her to feature on one of his tracks. But after Faith laid down her vocals, Tupac allegedly pulled a stunt, refusing to pay unless she got intimate with him, and she shut it down. Despite Faith repeatedly shutting down rumors of any romantic involvement with Tupac, Shug Knight, and Tupac suggested otherwise. Come January 1996, they dropped hints to Lynn Hirschberg of the New York Times that Tupac and Evans were in a relationship, with gifts exchanged for what Tupac implied were more than just friendly favors. Big E, on catching wind of the Times article, flew into a fit of rage and confronted Evans. Publicly, though, Biggie tried to play it off as a joke. But Tupac, in his track, Hit Him Up, left no room for interpretation, boldly claiming, I effed your B, you fat mother F, and you claim to be a player, but I effed your wife. You claim West Side when we ride, come equip with game. You claim to be a player, but I Hip-hop writers like Allison Samuels from Newsweek and Kierna Mayo from The Source painted Evans as a pawn in Tupac's revenge plot against Biggie and the ongoing power struggle between the two artists. The media wasn't exactly sympathetic towards Evans. In March 1996, Vibe even cracked a joke about her losing weight from all that running back and forth between the notorious Big and Tupac. Yet, as night fell, Tupac faced the repercussions of his choices, and the world of hip-hop mourned the loss of one of its icons. 
On September 7, 1996, Tupac Shakur fell victim to a drive-by shooting at the intersection of Flamingo Road and Cobalt Lane in Las Vegas, Nevada. Swiftly taken to the University Medical Center of Southern Nevada, he passed away six days later. He was 25 years old. Shugi, who found himself both a witness and a victim in the shooting, shared a chilling account of the incident with Las Vegas police during an interview just three days after the event. Recalling the night of September 7, 1996, as they cruised along Las Vegas Boulevard with rap music filling the air, a sudden burst of gunshots disrupted their conversation at a red light. Tupac was like trying to get to the back seat. I grabbed him and pulled him down. It was about 15 they hit my head. I grabbed him and pulled him down, Suge recounted to the police. Despite suffering bullet abrasions on his shoulder, neck, and chest, Suge emphasized that neither he nor Tupac provoked the shooters or knew them, maintaining a sense of confusion and shock during the chaotic moment. In the aftermath of the drive-by shooting, Suge highlighted a crucial detail about Tupac's reaction. Despite being unaware of the severity of his own injuries, Tupac expressed concern for Suge, stating, You the one they shot in the head. You shot in the head. In a 1996 MTV News interview. Just a week after Tupac's passing, Suge opened up about the aftermath. He shared how, despite the gravity of the situation, he and Tupac were still exchanging jokes as he hurriedly took him to the hospital. Pac looked at me and said, you know what? You need a doctor more than me. You don't want to shine your head. And we laughed the whole time going to find out what to the hospital. That's the conversation we had. He said, Pac saved my life. I got shot in the head and I got grazed in other places, but I still got the bullet in my head. It's still there. Trying to get him to the hospital didn't make me realize I was shot, because usually when you get shot in the head, the first thing the person does is panic. You know, bam, I'm shot in the head. I'm about to die. And once you do that, you can't drive nowhere. My whole thing was Pac was shot. I'm like, you shot, let me get you the hospital. I'm driving to the hospital and Pac looks at me and said, you know what, you need a doctor more than me. You the one shot in your head and we laughed the whole time we were finding our way to the hospital. Pac was a man the whole time. He was cracking jokes, he continued, saying he was conscious on the way to the hospital, he was conscious in the ambulance, he was conscious after they did the surgery. The feud took another heartbreaking turn, leading to the loss of yet another hip-hop icon. Six months after Tupac's passing, on March 9, 1997, Biggie became the victim of a drive-by shooting in Los Angeles, California. The night before, on March 8, 1997, he was in enjoying a vibrant Soul Train Awards after party in LA, hosted by Vibe and Quest Records at the Peterson Automotive Museum. The festivities were abruptly halted at 12.30 a.m. when the fire department shut down the party due to the enthusiastic crowd. Biggie, accompanied by his crew in two GMC Suburbans, decided to head back to the hotel. Seated in the front passenger seat alongside Lil Cease, he embarked on the journey while Diddy occupied the other vehicle with his bodyguards. As the clock struck 12.45 a.m., the street were alive with people dispersing from the party. Biggie's SUV paused at a red light near the museum when, out of nowhere, a black Chevrolet Impala pulled up. The driver, an unidentified individual sharply dressed in a blue suit and bow tie, rolled down his window, brandished a 9mm pistol, and unleashed a barrage of shots at Biggie's vehicle. Four bullets found their mark, and his entourage rushed him to Cedar sinai Medical Center. Despite the efforts of doctors, he was declared dead at 1.15 a.m. At just 24 years old, Biggie's life met a dark and tragic end. The autopsy, revealed 15 years later, provided the grim details. Only the final shot proved fatal, piercing through his right hip, impacting his colon, liver, heart, and left lung before coming to rest in his left shoulder. It marked the somber conclusion to an influential era in hip-hop. Rumors started swirling that Diddy paid Keith D a million dollars to take out Tupac and Suge Knight. This alleged hit supposedly led to the retaliation that resulted in Biggie's death, but Suge has yet to confirm this. Maybe that's why Tupac wanted to protect Madonna from Diddy, considering she and Diddy had a friendship too. Tupac knew about this connection and might have been worried about her safety.